So we'll start with the um, abnormalities. And I did just update both of these PowerPoints in um, Moodle. So if it looks a little different, that is why. I did, I updated them this morning in my office. So if you, if you downloaded them before, you may need to re-download them. And what is going on here? Hold on a second. Why isn't it? Oh, I'm not plugged in. I'm like, where's my thing of a jigger? Now this should, now this should. Analities, share the screen. Okay, so this one has, this is kind of fun because this is sort of like, um, well, I'm trying to think of what PowerPoint. There's just a lot of, uh, a lot of pictures. Terminology. This is going to be heavy on the terminology. So when we take when we do the um, the mini exam and the bulk of the questions come from these two powerpoints, it's going to be it's going to be multiple choice terminology, and then there'll be some pictures of images, and you just have to recognize it for what. It, so it's it's not it's not it's kind of almost like landmark is sort of what I'm thinking of. It's it's not super hard content. It's more more memorization of terminology and recognition of pictures. So it's not it's not super hard. So um, we're gonna go through, and these abnormalities are not really in your textbook. This PowerPoint, Amy created this when she was the course director and I haven't changed it very much at all. And really very few of these come from the textbook. So she just, I think, researched this topic and this is what she found. And then the, um, there is a few of them in chapter 35. Chapter 35 is the one that this um, unit is over. And um, so there's a few of them there, but not too many. And then most of chapter 35 is on uh, periapical lesions. So that's that's gonna be the, the next, um, PowerPoint that we get to, and hopefully we get through all of it because there are a lot of slides. Okay, so these are some defects in categories of defects. There's um, th there can be uh, abnormalities in the number of teeth, the size and shape of the teeth, the structure, how it developed, the eruption pattern, and then just sort of miscellaneous other anomalies. Um, so we have um, anodontia, which is the absence of teeth. These are just terms we're just going through and saying them out loud. Hypodontia is uh, partial anodontia or the missing, you know, um, some teeth, but not all. So most common we would think of as the third molars or maybe three molars for, um, for ortho, um, but also maybe somebody was born without their lateral incisors. That is not super duper common, but it's not super uncommon either. And then if premolars are missing um, congenitally, like if they were born without their premolars and they retained uh, a baby tooth, then the baby tooth may be ankylosed to the bone, which basically means the bone, the, the roots kind of fuse to the bone. So there's not a lot of like periodontal ligament. There's no real like bouncy support. It's just like locked into the bone. The bone is part of the root. Yeah, yeah. Ankylos is just they they kind of just fuse together, and there's no periodontal ligament space around it. Oh yeah, like the tongue is mm -hmm, tongue-tied ankyloglossia. Yeah, it's like it's anchored to the the soft tissue there on the in the inside of the mouth. Um, so here's an image of um, of a young kid who's missing teeth here. And just by taking this picture, you might not know that maybe they got knocked out. I mean, you wouldn't know. But then do, because of the age, you can look at the pano and you can see they have all these adult teeth forming underneath, but there's no um, incisors down there on the, thank you. Um, some of these are very dark. They're old, some of them are older and they're they're dark. But so you can see, there's no adult teeth down in there. That that um, and technically these still. I mean, this could be a made up story. 
<laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's what it looks like. But technically, those teeth are the first to pop in. So I suppose they could have been knocked out. But it's a nice thing. It's a nice example of how, you know, you wouldn't see it on the x-ray if this is true, if they literally weren't ever, um, if they never came through. So who knows what the real story is, but that's what we'll go with. That's how you can verify. You can verify that stuff by looking at um, looking at it on an x-ray. So here is an image of, um, of a retained primary tooth. Um, so a lot of, you'll notice that the roots are still there, but what do you notice about the roots? Short and wide. Super short and wide, right? So when we were when we're looking at primary teeth, sometimes uh, when we're first, especially if it's a bite wing and we don't have a, a PA of it, we're like, well, how do you know that's a baby tooth? Maybe it's just a big premolar. But baby teeth become incredibly obvious, especially if no root resorption has taken place, because you can see how incredibly short the roots are and how widespread they are. And there'll be some variation, but they'll never be anywhere near as long as a permanent molar's roots. Um, and they're bigger than a premolar um, by a little bit because they're a, a baby molar and the adult premolar takes its place, but there's not too much size difference there. They're just shaped a little bit different. Um, so here is another example of a retained um, baby tooth up here. And the, the molars are not quite as spread as wide, but you can see they're a lot shorter. It doesn't look as babyish to me, though. But um, yeah, it doesn't really look like a. that's what the slide says, but I'm looking at it going, I don't know. But it is it is in the place of where a premolar would go. So maybe it's just a different looking baby tooth yeah, but it it is, is the crown does look small it just looks more the enamel looks different like you can also if I back up one you can also sometimes this is in my you can the, if it didn't have this huge filling um the enamel the DEJ on baby teeth look different than the DEJ on adult teeth there's just lots of variation so that was the other thing that just made this one look a little bit suspicious is that the the DEJ looks a little bit almost more uh, permanent but anyways nevertheless that's what it's supposed to show and you can see that it has short roots so okay so some other terms hyperdontia um one or more extra teeth so you guys know the terminology like hypo less hyper more so it kind of is into intuitive um, supernumerary teeth is sort of the common phrase for extra teeth and pretty much anywhere where there's extra teeth, if they have extra wisdom teeth, if they have extra premolars, if they have extra anything, it's pretty much just categorized as a supernumerary teeth, um, tooth, with the exception of if there's a little tiny tooth right in between the central incisors. If there's a little tooth that comes out in between eight and nine, um, then it's called a mesiodens. So that's specific for that kind of uh, anomaly. It's a mesioden if it's between eight and nine. So here's a picture of an extra premolar down in here. And here's some extra premolars that erupted inside the mouth there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the extra, the extra premolar? Yes. Yeah. The reason you're able to tell is that because the existing one is uh, permanent, so that's how you decide that's an extra one. Say now, tell say it again. Which which one are you are you looking at this one? I want to know why. Uh, oh. Sure. Yes. Idea. So good question. So these two that have erupted are adult premolars, and you can recognize them by the shape and the size. So those are definitely adult premolar teeth. And so this one down here that's in the bone still, it looks very, it looks a little oddly shaped, but it looks very much like a premolar as well. And so that's how you can tell. Like those, there are no primary premolars. And yeah, there's no, so our mol, the primary molars are the ones you get. And so if it's a, if it's a premolar and it's erupted, then you, and there's more, then you know that's extra, super numerous. Um, Okay, so am I going backwards? I'm going backwards. Um, so here we have all kinds of extra teeth here in the front. Well, maybe there's just one. It just looks more than one, but um, so there's an extra lateral in here somewhere, but they fit quite nicely. 
Um, oh, I was counting. Sometimes I play with the animation and it entertains me. <laughs> Five, it's like a counting show. Okay, um, so here is another example of an extra premolar. So we know that these are permanent premolars. And so um, we know that that is a supernumerary premolar. Here's all kinds of funny little extra teeth. And a lot of times extra teeth may, I mean, may or may not be shaped differently. Like they're just, the fact that they're kind of like extra kind of give predisposes them to maybe being shaped non-traditionally as well. They might not be like a typical formed tooth. And that's, this is a good example here. This is just kind of a, you know, preform tooth. And so if there's um, extra, you know, material in there, extra tooth buds floating around. They don't always um, form like regular shapes, typical shaped tooth teeth. Here's another itsy bitsy one between the lateral and the canine there. And then here's specifically a mesioden. So it's between eight. So it is a supernumerary. So it's not wrong to call it a supernumerary, but because it's between eight and nine, it's specifically called a mesioden. I don't know why they call it something special, but that's, that is how it is. And there's a picture of it um, in, yeah. They've obviously like disclosed this patient. If this was a color picture, I'm sure that would be disclosing solution, I would think. I mean, I guess, I don't know. Okay, so here's another supernumerary behind the molar. It's just like a little cute little baby tooth. Not a real baby tooth, but a baby supernumerary tooth. Um, and here's another one between the canine and the lateral. Just a tiny little one there. All kinds of little ones. You'll see, um, it's not that uncommon really. I mean, it's not like you'll see them on every patient, but you know, you'll definitely have patients in your practice who have extra wisdom teeth or, um, that's what I saw most often, although I did see a few, um, still bony impacted supernumerary teeth, but usually you'd see like a tiny, a tiny wisdom tooth, extra wisdom tooth or something like that. So some more um, terminology, macrodentia, um, macro being bigger, micro being smaller. So macrodontia, um, teeth are larger than normal. Microdontia, teeth are smaller than normal. And for the smaller than normal, it's most commonly the lateral. So just because they're smaller doesn't mean they are a peg lateral. That's more of a specific shape, but they could just be smaller in size. And people can have that on different, different teeth. Um, but in general, it's most often a lateral. So here's a lateral that is a macrodontia lateral. It's it's a larger lateral than you would expect to see. Um, and you can, it might be the, the curvature of the picture, but it doesn't look like this one is as large on the other side. Um, so that's a macrodontia. And this, this is specifically a peg lateral. Um, you can have a smaller lateral as well that's not as pointed at the end. You kind of think of the pegs as being more pointed at the end. Um, okay, so here's a couple terminology that you definitely will get tested on and that people definitely get mixed up. So star this slide. Um, so fusion is the union of two adjacent tooth buds by the dentin. So they fuse pretty good. They fuse into the dentin um, and or the enamel, but typically they fuse a little bit more. Usually they fuse into the dentin. So it's two adjacent teeth that fuse together. That's fusion. Gemination is the aborted, so that it started the process of uh, twinning itself, and then it stopped the process. And so you have this attempt of a single tooth bud to divide. So it's not two different teeth that came together. It's one gemination is one tooth that tried to divide. So, and then concrescence is the union between two roots of two or more teeth in the cementum only. So you're just going to get a very superficial connection and it's only going to happen on the root surface. And that's concrescence. So a tip for the fusion and the gemination is to count all the teeth. So if you count the, the ladder, like the lower anterior um, incisors, and there's three of them, but one of them looks really big, then you have fusion. You, yeah. 
No. Oh, no. <laughs> and if you count them and you get like five, but you only see four roots, then um, that's gemination. It, it was starting to divide or it wanted to divide. Yeah. Does gemination only include two, so one root, two crowns? I think it can be. I think it depends on how far along it gets. I think it's more common to see it in the coronal portion than the roots, but I don't know for a fact that it can't happen on the roots too. But I just, a lot of these examples, what's that? Infusion is more common to see the two roots. Yeah, in in actually, I think there's examples here of fusion. It just looks like one giant tooth, and you just it all fuses together. So there's probably a lot more examples, and you could probably find more than what you'll see on this PowerPoint. So just remember when I test you on what's on the power. So I'm not going to ask you some tricky dick question. I'm just going to ask you what is there. Yeah. Or gemination. Yeah. So, um, so fusion is two teeth. So you got two teeth that want to come together. So usually it looks like one really big tooth, and you're going to have less teeth than you would expect to see. So you would. So one of those. So if you have four incisors, you'll just see three teeth, but one of them will look really big. So you'll know that two kind of came together. For gemination, you have one tooth that tries to divide, so you'll look like you have more teeth. So you might look like you have, it might look like there's five incisors instead of four incisors. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, it makes you look like yeah, I'll get, let me get to a picture and then we, I'll point it out because that might help um, when you get the picture. So here's a, here's a picture of fusion and see how you can kind of see how you can almost like make up where the tooth should have naturally been separated by two but um, it came together. And it may be hard to tell until you look clinically and can count the teeth. Like if you just see an x-ray, maybe it's not always gonna be super clear if you're looking at fusion or gemination. So, so it, it might be one of those things where you actually need to look in the mouth and count the teeth visible that you can see. So, but that's what she was talking about is it's the roots are also fused. So this is fusion. Yeah, and then this is gemination. So here you can see, and this is in a primary tooth, but you can see that one tooth tried to separate. So when when they weren't in such a mixed dentition, when it, when at whatever point when it was just their baby teeth and you just see from just the coronal portion, it might have looked like they had five incisors because or four and a half incisors because this was separated there. So um, but you can see their root is still fused. The root is still fused. So it's not, you know, it's not super straightforward, but you just have to memorize the terminology and the definition. And then if I if there's a picture of something that looks like it's all merged together as one big giant tooth, that's going to be more fusion. If it looks like a tooth trying to separate into two, that's going to be gemination. That a tooth? That's a primary tooth, I think. Yes, yeah, it looks like it's underneath. Yeah, Leah. Is fusion gemination a primary tooth that's completely unrelated I think it would be separate. Yeah, I don't think necessarily one would affect the other, but that's a good question. I don't know for sure, but I would assume that, you know, if they have the tendency to, to do that in general, I don't know if it's just a fluke or if they're more like predisposed to having that happen. So, um, but I would think it would just happen in isolated incidences. Um, so here's another example of fusion. So this is what I mean by looking clinically. Like if you look at an x-ray, it might be hard to tell, but you can see here's a canine and here's a canine. And in between the canines, there's three incisors. So that, that helps you know that that's fusion, to, that these two incisors here fuse together. So that's fusion. And then here we have the eight and nine, and it looks like eight and nine tried to split. So then we know that that's gemination because it looks like eight and nine tried to tried to divide. Yes, you. But it might not always look that way. Like if it's a really good 
gemination that got pretty far along, it may look like you have more teeth. But like here, you're like, well, I can see I have eight and nine. They just look funny. They just look like they tried to divide in half. So you wouldn't really say, count those as like four central incisors, but it may happen. Like if they if they split pretty good so that it look, does look like more, then you would count more teeth. So it just kind of depends every, you know, it, like with any kind of gene mutation or it just it probably depends on how much, how far along it got before the process stopped. Yeah. So here is another one. This is, it's a little tricky with these mixed dentition, um, you know, cause they got some permanent teeth coming up, but here's another tooth that um, is gemination. It, it looks like one tooth fusing. It, this is a little bit hard though. I mean, one tooth splitting, not one tooth fusing, sorry. This is a little harder example though, because with a mixed dentition, it's harder to count the teeth. You know, if you have like a permanent dentition, you're like, well, I know what I'm supposed to be looking at. But when it's a mixed dentition, it can look very, you know, you got a couple of baby teeth, you got a couple of adult teeth and what's supposed to be where. Um, so this would be harder to know, I'm looking at gemination or I'm looking at fusion. It would be a little bit harder because of the mixed dentition, but that that is what is supposed to be happening here is gemination. So the dividing of a tooth. Here's another x-ray where you can see one tooth tried to kind of split in half there. It's a baby tooth. Maybe this is more common in baby teeth because they're showing it more often in baby teeth. But, um, and then here, this one here is fusion. Again, you can kind of count up the teeth. You have um, a canine over here and this would be the canine here and there's just three incisors. So if there's just three incisors, you're like, well, we're missing one, but that one looks awfully big. So they must have fused together. So that that kind of that you can work that out by the radiograph and looking clinically. Here is a example of concrescence um, out of the mouth, obviously, <laughs> and um, so the roots just kind of got intertwined. And it looks to me as though one of these was probably an impacted molar, obviously, because they're at totally wonky um, angles to each other. So one was probably impacted in the bone. They, got that out. <laughs> they probably had to like cut open the bone and <laughs> to make a big old hole somewhere to get that out. But yeah, that's pretty crazy. And then here's an x-ray of the teeth. So it's just showing how th there's a lot of separation. It's not like the roots are uh, fused. They're just kind of connected by the cementum. So it's like a shallow connection. Okay. Some more terminology. So dilaceration, um, trying to think of how to think of, <laughs> memorize this, but dilaceration basically just means that there's like a waviness or, you know, curly roots or wavy roots. So it's the roots are not taking that kind of straight down conical formation. There's like the um, one, you know, the end takes a big sharp turn or they kind of swoop off to one side. Um, so that's dilaceration. A bent tooth usually as a result of trauma during formation or eruption. Torodontism is a very specific looking thing. And when we look at the picture, toro means bull. And so they, the root, I guess they think the root looks like bull horns or something. I don't know where they get it from, but that's that's where the term comes from. And it's a very broad at the base. So you don't have this nice conical apex anymore. It's very broad at the base. And so we'll see a picture of that in a second. A very large pulp chamber. Supernumerary roots kind of, you can put it together the same as supernumerary teeth, supernumerary roots. So you have extra roots. So on a mandible molar, on a mandibular molar, you expect to just to see two. If you see three, that's a supernumerary. The other most common would be bifurcated, um, like canines or premolars. So generally speaking, premolar roots, you just have the one. And so if it's bifur bifurcated, that's a bit of an anomaly, although it's not that uncommon. Um, so here's the dilaceration. So you can see really bendy. This is a nightmare to do a root canal on um, because obviously they have to get around all these hard curves. So this is, um, that makes it a challenge. So that's dilaceration with the bendy wavy roots. Um, here's another example. It's just the apex is curved and this they perforated 
because maybe they didn't take a picture before they started that. <laughs> I don't know, but that's um, difficult to get the to get the end there. And then this is the two. Doesn't that just look like a little squid? I know, isn't that odd? And the coloring, if the coloring is so weird, but so um, this is the real little odd looking tooth. <laughs> it's a very strange shape. Um, and then this one is kind of cool because you can see the bifurcated premolars here and over here. And I almost feel like they're just, I mean, it's kind of blurry. It's hard to see, but it almost looks like there's some bifurcation in these other areas too. But definitely this premolar stands out, but it looks like some other areas too. So it's... Um, so when they do, and I don't even know how often they do this anymore, but when they do ortho, what premolars would you think they most often pick out when they do ortho? And why do you think, do you think there's any logic to that? Any reason? More space. No. More space. Is that why? Yeah. <laughs> that, that wasn't what I knew, but maybe that's true. That might be true, actually. What else? Charting. Charting. Yeah, that that you know, both of those reasons sorry. could be real. I just, from what I have learned, it's just if a two if a premolar is going to be bifurcated, it's more oftentimes the second premolar, and the first premolars don't tend to be bifurcated as much, so they're easier. And I don't, I mean, that's just what I heard. But that's why it's the premolar always bifurcated. For the maxilla. Yeah. But then why do they take them out? For space. They <laughs> create space. Sometimes people have, it's because the, like people have a, their more teeth than their mouth. No, but they can take out the second in their space too. But they, but they'll, but I thought they always took out one over the other. Maybe it's an old school thing. Maybe they don't do that anymore. Well, that's what someone had told me that too. Never mind. You're not going to be tested on it anyway. So it is the first. Do they take out? Do they take out? Yeah. 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 Because the second is more often right? So they most often take out the first premolar. Well, that's why first the first is treated, but men that are second are more likely to be bifurcated. It's a bifurcation on men. Now I have to do some research. Do they take out the bifurcated one? Yeah. That's, that's what I see. Yeah. That makes sense because the second one's a more. So the second man gives you a way often bifurcated, and the first maxillaries are all different. So they take out the bifurcated. Well, that's true. That's true. Don't worry, everyone. This is just conversation. You're not going to be tested on this. No, but this is a good one. The result of two sides are size discrepancies to permit corrections of axial inclination of inferior teeth or to reduce vertical height of the face. So there are. So it is a space thing too. And uh, interesting. Well, I don't know that much about work. Clearly. Okay. No, that was interesting. That was actually, that was actually really good to know. But in general, they don't, they are probably trying to avoid taking out all premolars, perhaps. I, I mean, they have to take out stuff if they don't have room. I mean, some people's arches are tiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Enough on that topic. Moving on. <laughs> supernumerary roots. So here's a picture of um here's a picture of a, a supernumerary on a mandibular molar, and then you can see the bifurcated um what is that a canine I think so um, bifurcated tooth there, and then here's an image of the torodonticism. <laughs> so you can see the roots very distinctive apex. It spreads out, and I guess the two little bottom areas sort of look like horns maybe. And so maybe that's where that comes from. But a very broad pulpal chamber, especially down at the apex and a very broad 
space. So that's torodontism, very easy to pick out. Is this second also? It looks like it's tending toward it, doesn't it? It it does look a little broad for sure. Um here is, oh, this is really hard to see, but there's a little bit of a bifurcation on this canine, but it's really hard to see. Every time I, this comes up, I'm like, what are we looking at? And then it takes me a second to see the bifurcation. So it's just, it's up over here on the canine. Um, okay, some more terminology. Emerald, um, enamel pearls, small round radiopaque. So they're gonna be more, they're gonna be radiopaque like enamel, right? Because it's an enamel pearl. Um, and it's seen in the cervical portion of the root. So it's usually seen in the larger upper portion of the pulp chamber, but an enamel pearl can be in other areas as well. Um, so it's not just located there, but you can see it there. A pulp stone is a well-defined radiopacity in the pulp chamber. No clinical significance except for blocking and endodontic access. So um, it would be, that would be, um, that would be a, a bummer for a, for an endodontist. Um, and I don't know if I made it clear, but the enamel pearl is on the outside. Did I make it sound like that? Or did I make it sound like it was, I think I made it sound like it was on the inside, but it's on the outside. And then dens in dente, um, it results um, of an infolding of when the tooth is developing, it's sort of like an infolding of the structures. And so it gives it a very different um, clinical look. And then it also gives it a different radiographic look. So it's most often in permanent lateral incisors, small portion of the population, one to 5% of population, um, you can see this in. Um, and so everything sort of infolds before it all calcifies. The Leonge's premolar is the opposite. It's sort of like a pooching out of everything. So everything kind of like goes outwards and it makes, instead of the normal, um, the normal anatomy of like the grooves for the premolars, it almost looks like a little peak or something. Like there's a little peak in the center where you where you naturally find like a, a central groove of the premolars. And so we'll we'll look at um, that. So that's an outfolding of the enamel and the dens and dente. And they call it dens and dente because it looks like a tooth within a tooth. So radiographically, it almost looks like there's a second not well developed tooth inside the tooth. So that's why that's why it's it's that's yeah tooth and tooth that's what dens and dente is or means. So here's a picture of an enamel pearl. You will come across this, you, or you can come across this while you're scaling, um, and you so you could be like going over and over and over and over and over, and then hopefully you would when you're like what the heck am I scaling? Hopefully you can then look at a radiograph and be like oh there's a thing there and it's not coming off and it's actually quite radiopaque and it's not changing shape. So maybe that's an enamel pearl, like, you know, process of elimination, you'll get to that point eventually when you cannot do anything to get it off and it's driving you bonkers. Um, and it's not that uncommon, really. Um, and then here is a couple uh, examples of enamel pearls. You can see they look pretty round. They're on the root surface where enamel shouldn't be, right? Um, and you might at first think it's calculus, but calculus is jagged and spur-like. Um, kind of looks like a like a little spur sticking out where um, and you know irregular where an enamel pearl will look a little bit smoother and so you'll um, be able to differentiate at some point. Um, but in the beginning, it might be tricky. You might be like, well, that should be calculus, right? Um, here's another enamel pearl in the percation um, that would you know would make it. Percations are hard enough to scale, and then you stick a little hard piece of enamel in there and it just changes the, the structure. So it makes it a little trickier. Here is uh, an example of a pulp stone. And so that tooth could be vital and not really have any problems unless something happens and they end up needing a root canal and then that could be problematic. But that's what that looks like, pulp stone. Um, and so I guess this is, this is not a great picture because you can't really see it. To me, I mean, not a leaf. Um, yeah, you 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 look at it more. You can see it better from looking at the occlusal or the incisal surface, or more like you said from the lingual surface. So there's other pictures that are a little bit better. 
It does. Yeah. But if you looked on the lingual side, it might have even, you might start to see the aspects of a dens and dente. It's not a great picture. And there's a little fistula there. So something is not happy. And that could be coming from that lateral. So, um, and if this is supposed to be the radiograph that's going along with the real image, sometimes that's what happens. You'll get, you can see that there's um, some pathology happening at the apex there. This looks almost like a little tooth within a tooth. That's the dens and dente. Um, and you could more of the strange infolding look, you'd see it more from the lingual side. And here's just this, another example of it. And you can see how it's this kind of infolding of the enamel. Those are some how it appears. And it probably looks different on different radiographs, different different people. Um, their tooth would look would show up differently. So here's some more images of it. You can see how you can see it more from the lingual aspect, it's kind of an infolding here and here. It just looks like a looks different. It's not always the same. Those are just some examples of it. And then for the um, Leandra's premolar, here's like you can see like a little spike, like a little extra, and then you can see it really well here and here. It's like a like a little bump out of enamel instead of instead of a group. I have never heard that, but that could possibly be very true because if I was going to say that pulp is really high. So they they just say what you said. Don't go right into the pulp. Or like a liner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it like builds up some secondary dentin and maybe pushes down the pulp chamber or something. Is that what they're hoping? Interesting. No, I didn't I don't know. I'd never heard that, but that wouldn't really happen on our side as much. But you certainly could hear about that doing assisting for sure. That's cool. Yeah, it does look like it's coming up very high. So those are just some different terminologies there. So okay, oh dear. I think I have to pick up the speed. I'm going to go through a few more before I give you guys a break. Um, and then the other the other PowerPoint is um, not as long as this one. But OK, so external root resorption caused by chronic periapical or periodontal infection, pressure from tumors, cysts, rapid orthodontic movement, um, or unknown cause. Sometimes it just kind of happens, and they don't know why. And so the resorption is happening on the outside, internal. Um, Root resorption can be from trauma, exposure to heat or chemicals, bacterial invasion of the pulp. And that is like where the tooth is starting to eat itself from the inside out. So external root resorption is kind of going from the outside in, I guess you could say. And then internal is going from the inside out. A lot of times they try to stop both of those processes with root canals, but it doesn't always work. And a lot sometimes they have to end up extracting the tooth. And you'll learn more about that in oral paths. So here's just some pictures. Um, this might be from rapid orthodontic. If they um, put too much pressure on the tooth and try and move them too fast, they can resorb the roots. That's one of the probably biggest iatrogenic causes of it. And then other than that, it could be trauma. Um, and then here's an ex some examples of internal root resorption. And this can be a, like a healthy person, low caries risk, low perio risk. And then all of a sudden they got internal root resorption. So it doesn't, it can happen very spontaneously. I've seen, I've had, it's such a bummer, especially if it's somebody who has like great, and they're like, what, I'm losing my tooth for what reason? It's just, it can be very odd. But um, that's, that's that. Pulpal sclerosis, um, you can see that the pulpal chamber kind of just scarred over and sort of fused. There's not a very large, um, pulpal chamber. And this happens naturally as we age. We get secondary dentin buildup and our pulp, cha pulp chambers become smaller, but it can happen, you know, I guess for other reasons as well, but um, you'll see it um, happen more in older people. And then uh, pulp canal um, obliteration, this one you can see there's just there's something extra there too, but you can see there's just no um, pulp chamber at all. So, oh, you know what I probably have to do? I probably have to refresh Moodle on my side. I'll refresh it on the break. Um, so pulp canal um, 
obliteration is the calcification or um, deposition of hard tissues within the pulp cavity. And then there's these um, possible reasons why that might happen. I have not seen that very often. Abnormalities and eruptions. So you can have impacted teeth, um, bony impaction, partially or complete. So it's still maybe half in the bone or totally sideways in the bone. Soft tissue impaction. Um, they're through the bone, but they're still covered fully with tissue. Um, transposition, it's a, a tooth that has erupted in the wrong place. So it's like a canine trying to come in, you know, where the premolars are or where the lateral is or something like that. So here's some images here um, of some impacted teeth. Can impacted canines is not that uncommon. I mean, it's, you know, within reason. That's something you might see. Impacted third molars, obviously, you get that a ton. Um, so some images there. Soft tissue impaction, there's no more bone above it, but it's covered in soft tissue. Impacted canines. And then transposition. So here's a canine trying to come up through the uh, central incisor area in the mandible. I don't know. No, no, that's a good question. I will ectopic. It's maybe they are similar terms. Yeah, I'll write that one down and look it up. And maybe that's a more maybe that's a more preferred term. I that's what I think of too, ectopic pregnancy. <laughs> but that might be a more um, preferred term. So I will look that up. Trans. Okay. Acquired dental anomalies. So we've already kind of covered this a little bit. We've looked at some attrition, um, physiological wear resulting from normal function, maybe attrition. There's some level of attrition that's normal and some that's not so normal. Um, abrasion, abnormal non-physical um, physiological wear caused by foreign substances or excessive habits, um, toothbrush abrasion, clenching and grinding. Um, erosion, damage to the tooth involving chemical action. So like erosion from like acid, like if they are vomiting too much um, GERD, if they have GERD or acid reflux or vomit a lot or suck on lemons or eat sour candies, you know, something like that, then they'll have um, erosion and it's, so it's non-bacterial. So here's some images from radiograph perspective and then from a clinical view of, of attrition. Somebody, this is not normal, like somebody should not have that much attrition. They have a massive bruxing uh, problem if they if they have, you know, wear, worn away their teeth that much and they need to, they should be wearing a guard or something. But you will see that. You'll see people with that much attrition and they just don't wear a, a night guard. Um, and then, and then here's another picture of attrition. And you start to get a little bit of a cupping because the dentin is softer. And so it will erode faster from other, like just environmental, you know, being exposed. It'll, so it cups a little bit, kind of scooped out just a bit. Um, and then we have abrasion. So you can see that's at the CEJ typically. Um, and so you, it'll happen right when you get to the soft, because it's softer, the cementum and the dentin is softer than enamel. So you start to get that wear right there at the gum line. Um, and it can be kind of notched out, like they call them abfractions, AB, abfractions, um, or toothbrush abrasion. And they can be from clenching and grinding or some kind of a occlusal issue. Um, and then it can also just be from mechanical wear as well. Um, and, uh, and then here's a picture of erosion. So it usually looks pretty smooth. It's not like pitted or... Um, it usually looks kind of shiny and smooth and it just, but once you start getting through that enamel layer and you expose the softer stuff, it can go quicker. Um, and it's usually on the backs of teeth. If it's GERD, acid reflux, or vomiting, um, if it's sucking on lem lemons, it could be on the front too. Just so, or if it's exposure to some other kind of chemical or acid that would hit the front. Who was in the class that was at ODHA with the lady who was talking about wear and tear? Anybody here? in the class, she told a really fast story. I don't know the details, but she said that the worst um, 
acid erosion she ever saw was a patient that worked for some chemical plant where there was um, acidic gases in these tubs and one of them spilled or it, it whatever, it, the, the contents of the um, thing came out and he like inhaled it. And I mean, he had massive neurological damage, but she said every one of his teeth was just a nub. It was just like the, whatever that chemical was, it all eroded and he just had a mouthful of itsy bitsy little, she said they all looked like they'd been um, prepped for a, a crown. Like they were just whittled down to like little, little points. And I was like, that sounded so horrible to me. I know, don't work for a chemical plant. <laughs> be happy you're all going to be hygienists. You don't ever have to do that. So here's another um, erosion picture. And then very quickly, non-tooth related, mandibular tori. It's the excess bone down there on the bottom and the top of torus. And you'll see that people have different size. They can have exostosis on the outside. They can have all three or one or, and some people don't notice it. And then all of a sudden they notice it and they're like, oh my goodness, I'm growing cancer in my mouth. And no, no, it's just bone. Um, so it's quite common. Here's a picture of um, some bulbous tor torus on the palate. And um and then retained root tip. So they might have an extraction. Maybe the, the it was a difficult extraction. The dentist didn't get all the root out. Sometimes you'll get little pieces of bone that break off and work their way out as well. They're like almost like little splinters of bone and things like that. So you can see different things. And that's it. Okay, take a break. Let's just take, let's come back at, um, it's 2.10. So let's come back at, let's just do eight minutes because I want to make sure that I have enough time. So come back at, 218, and then I want to finish the next PowerPoint. Uh, yeah. Does it matter right Hold on, let me just pause this because I hate it when my conversations are recorded. <laughs> okay, so for the live patient, so tomorrow, Wednesday's group, that's your last. That's our last lab. There's no more labs, no more Dexter. Yay! You survived. You survived. So you're going to be um, practicing on each other. I've been dividing it into people who have experience and people who have not. And the people who have not had experience, they go first because there's not, it's really not even. This year is the last year I have to do two labs where people practice on each other because really... If there is, if you're in, un, not experienced, it's better to have the stress free and have the whole hour. And it means more people can just get a half hour. And anyways, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, anyway, so that's what you're doing Wednesday. So, uh, weeks 14 and 15, you're going to just come in for your one appointment, your live patient. But what, if you have not done this already, I know I sent out an uh, announcements about this, but if you have not done this already, you're going to go into real axiom, not train. You're going to go into real axiom. You're going to go down here to this little envelope icon and you're going to open it and press plus, and you're just going to go to the two. And I just write front and front office pops up. And it's, so that should work for you. Cause I don't know why it does. For, if it doesn't for me, it should work for you. But so um, just front office, and then subject, you know, radiology, live patient, blah, blah, blah. And then here, um, I cut the, the patient information from the Google Doc that I sent you guys. And so, and then you just paste it in here. So paste it into the message and fill it out. If they're not going to have insurance, you don't have to put, obviously you don't have an insurance number, but you do want to put, she does still want address. She might want date of birth. She probably definitely still wants that stuff, I would imagine. So anything you can anything you can give, even if they don't have insurance, anything that's here, and then just delete what you don't need that's directly related to insurance. Yeah. Do you have to do it with the asking? Yes, you do have to do it. So she, I did not tell you guys this in due time. So I, it was my mistake. Um, and so um, she's had a few people approach her and then she reminded me to do it in Axiom. So that's, I am reminding you now. So that was my fault because I didn't tell you guys that soon enough. So if anybody needs to do this, now is the time to do this because what you'll do is you'll you'll fill this out and then with your patient information and you will send it to the front office. And then what they'll do is they will take this and they'll create a patient chart. 
So there's no way that they can create a patient chart unless you give them that information. So they'll do that. They have already gone into scheduler. Um, they've already gone into scheduler and given you um, given you your designated time that is what you signed signed up for. And so when you go into scheduler and you look at that day, you'll see your name somewhere. This is not you guys, obviously, but um, you'll see your name and you'll see your spot. And so you'll go in there and you'll schedule your patient, but that can only happen after you've given Sarah and Brenda the information through Messenger because it's HIPAA information. So that's why they want it through Axiom. It's it's privacy. And so they don't want you just emailing it or handing them a piece of paper. And so that's why they want you to do it through Axiom. So then you'll schedule your patient. You should have learned how to do that in EHR. If you don't remember how to do it, you can ask Allison, she can help you with that. I'm not an expert in scheduling, so don't ask me. Um, but um, you should be able to just populate it, like select your patient, I would think, or something. And then once all of that is done, then you can go in and you can fill out a medical history form. You should fill out the medical history form to the best of your ability before the day of the live patient experience, because you have two and a half hours. The first half hour is technically for taking vitals and for to update the medical history and to review it. But if you have to start from scratch, it, it's totally doable. And those of you that have clinic patients, you may find that you do have to do that. And that's okay, but if the majority of you can do this ahead of time, you'll just save yourself gobs and gobs of time. And if you do have a clinic patient, um, you can call them on the phone and get this information um, over the phone. So you can call them on the phone. Yeah? Can you throw it out on Flash at home? That I don't actually know. That's a good question. I would ask Allison that question. Uh, Santoro, Professor Santoro. What's that? I don't know where we live here. I don't either. I'm not, I well, don't I really know. I can do it my friend and do it in person. Even like, what? I mean, yeah. I asked that question if we could just give a printed out version because there is one available on mm -hmm. Google to our patient and they get the password. Mm -hmm. I think the whole concern is not filling it out in front of them because like we can't just show our, you know, action to other people. Right. Yeah. In interest with HIPAA. Right, right. And things like that. So you yes. can take it on the paper and then do it on your own site. Mm -hmm. What other schools do. Well, can you okay. call them on the phone at, from home? Well, and you're they want you to use the the phone in the clinic that is the paperwork and then you just do yeah. it on your own time. I think that. Yeah, that's usually, I do know that there are, there is some rules around that. And so I would double check. I would double check with HIPAA. Professor Santoro. Yeah, because HIPAA rules are very strict here, and I do not want to be the one to tell anyone to go ahead and do something that violates it because they take it very seriously. Because my my patient is the Monday we get back from mm -hmm. so I can't do it ahead of time. Well, you can do it ahead of time if you get the chart in like this week. You could do it before Friday. I mean, it doesn't take that long. You can do it over the phone. So you, I mean, it they'll get your chart made fast. All right. I mean, I and then you can. Mhm. Mm well. Mm -hmm. Um. I just to be clear though, the appointment has to be made before you put the medical history. Yes. Screening first, and then you try to do the appointment like the two minutes afterwards, or the medical history. And then you have to start a new one. Yeah, like in the book, and then the medical history. Because I tried to do that. I didn't fill out the medical history. You did it. Like then I went in and it's gone. Yeah. That is a very good, yeah, don't do anything with your patient's chart until you have scheduled them. That's very good information because that would be a bummer to have to redo the whole thing. So that's, so everyone has been, everyone has been warned. So that's what you want to, so you want to get, you want to get in here and get your patient information, honestly, sooner than later. Like you guys should at very least, even if you don't have your medical history done, you need to get your patient information sent to Brenda and Sarah so that they can make a chart. This should not be like last minute. They, so this week you should get this information to them so that they can at very least make a chart and then you can schedule them. And then the medical history thing, you know, you just will work it out as you have time, but you do need to make time to get this information to them this week. Okay. So let me get this back up and then we will finish this up and we only have like 20 minutes left.
So I'm going to set a timer or else I'll go over. Okay, so um, interpretation of periapical lesion. So it's it's a lot of things look very similar. This isn't super duper hard. There's some terminology to be able to kind of separate some of the um, some of the different things. Um, so periapical lesions can have it radiolucency down at the apical, the the um, apex of the of the root of the tooth, and it can happen from a very large carious lesion. It can be from trauma. It can be from periodontal disease. Sometimes if if there's so much such a deep pocket and there's so and there's bacteria has been able to penetrate all the way down through there, you can get sort of a perio abscess. And so it's like, what comes, you know, you know, what's happening? Is it the tooth or is it this abscess? You know, it's hard to say. So if, uh, a lot of times they'll try to clear one thing up and see if the other resolves. Um, inflammation from the pulp extends to the bone and around the tooth and the infection that comes out um, resorbs the bone, just like infection from periodontal disease resorbs the bone. Um, so periapical lesion. So here there's a couple, this is sort of a drawing of um, the different stages or the different things that can happen. So A is a widening of the peri um, periodontal ligament. So at first you may not notice this gigantic radiolucency, but you may see a widening of the, of the ligaments down at the bottom of the apex. B is just the radiolucency sort of encapsulated. And so you can see that there's a little bit more of a radiolucent sort of lining to the, to the abscess. And then C on the mesial root and the distal root of C, this one here, the um, K radiolucency is not encapsulated. So you don't really see a definition. You just, there's just like a radiolucency and then it goes into bone. You don't see sort of like this denser bone around it. And then you can see an area that's highly dense, like abnormally dense, and that's this condensing osteitis. And that's just sort of buildup of bone um, around the periapical um, lesion. So you can see that. And you can sort of see it-ish in this radiograph. Like here, there's some um, sort of widening of the periodontal ligaments down here a little bit of sort of um, a radiolucent, large radiolucent area. And then over here, you can see, um, I shouldn't say large, that's not really what I meant, but you can see just some radiolucency down at the bottoms here. But here you can see this, this um, radiopaque area that comes away from the, the roots. And so this is that condensing osteitis, sort of a buildup um, of the bone or dense, the bone becomes more dense in that area. Um, okay, so there's periapical granuloma. It's the most common periapical radiolucency in dental practice. Um, and that specifically, it's a, a localized mass of uh, chronically inflamed granulation tissue um, at the apex of a non-vital tooth. So if it's non-vital, it's going to end up with a root canal. Um, it's the body's attempt to sort of neutralize it, sort of deal with the toxins and, or whatever that irritating factor is. It's um, can oftentimes it can be asymptomatic, meaning they don't necessarily have symptoms. It's asymptomatic. They're not necessarily feeling pain or anything from it. The tooth is non-vital and it requires a root canal. So then there's acute or chronic abscesses. There's, um, and this is, if it's acute, it's the symptom is it's usually pretty painful, usually very uncomfortable. Painful localized collection of pus at the root um, apex. Symptomatic, so it's going to be maybe hot, cold, sensitive, just throbbing pain maybe. Um, tooth is non-vital. It will require a root canal. And then if it's chronic, some people will have like a, a radiolucency in their mouth for a super long time. They don't have a fistula necessarily. They don't feel like it's bothered. You know, they're not bothered by it. So if it's been in there for a while, they call it chronic. Long-standing, low-grade inflammatory reaction to a toxic irritant. Oftentimes, again, there's that asymptomatic, it might not have any symptoms, often associated um, with a fistula. If a fistula is present, sometimes they call a fistula uh, a, a gum boil or a pimple, um, or yeah, it's like a trap. And that basically what it is, is it's a pressure relief valve. 
if they didn't, it's releasing the pressure of the pus buildup in the abscess. If And your body just finds a path of least resistance to come out and relieve that pressure. And if it if they didn't have the fistula, they'd be in a world of pain. It would really, really hurt. So sometimes if they don't notice the fistula, they're like, nothing's wrong, but sometimes they feel the fistula, either they, you know, they just noticed it, they saw it, they felt it, you know, in their mouth with their tongue or whatever, or when they were brushing their teeth, maybe they bonked it. And so then they're like, why not this pimple on my gum? And so they don't realize the connection, but if they didn't have it there, then they would really more than likely be feeling more pain from the, from the abscess. Um, and that also requires, uh, root canal. So you can see no matter if it's a granuloma, an acute abscess, or a chronic abscess, they all pretty much end up with needing root canal. So um, periapical lesion, well-defined radiolucent lesion at the apex. Tooth has a crown, um, tooth has crown post without endo treatment. I don't know what that's, what am I saying there? Tooth has a crown post without endo treatment. Maybe. Is it? Oh, and there's the radiolucency. I guess that must, must be just be referring to that. But you can see here's a periapical lesion there. You can, if, if that is, that's what that's pointing to, then this is um, a crown of the post, but there's no endo. Oh, maybe that is what gets yeah, oh, I don't know. My brain is slowly disintegrating. Um, so, but there's, so they've put a post in here, um, but there's no endo in the tooth, but there's this period of pollution. So there's more treatment that's needed there. And you can see some radiolucency through this molar as well in the, in the apex there. Um, some more relatively well-defined radiolucent lesion at the apex here. And then the tooth um, has a very large restoration. So sometimes they'll put in a huge restoration, kind of heroics, but it irritates the pulp so much it ends up needing a root canal, it ends up causing that issue. Um, cysts can also be a lesions that are seen um, oftentimes sort of around the apex area. And a cyst is gonna be specific and di different from an abscess because an abscess is, is an infection. And so there's pus in an abscess, but a cyst may be filled with air or just fluid um, it can be, it could be filled with soft tissue or exudate, which is basically pus. Um, so it can be filled with different things, but it's variable. So that's the take home point is if it's a cyst, it can be filled with different things. If it's, if it's like a straight abscess, it's just pus. It's just an infection. Impossible to know what is inside of a cyst until they go in and remove it. And usually that's what has to be done if it's like large enough and, you know, kind of problematic and affecting the vitality or the health of teeth. And sometimes the teeth have to go with it as well. So here's an acute um, exacerbation of a chronic periapical abscess. So they had uh, an abscess and they just let it go, let it go. And you can see there's a lot of swelling in and around this area down in the vestibule. And you can also see swelling in their cheek. And this is really, it's dangerous. I mean, you guys have all heard the stories of like kids that had a big cavity and it just went on and on and on. They had abscess and then the infection like traveled and um, they ended up dying from it. Like there's been horrible stories of kids with, you know, from neglect and, um, you know, like a strong public health message about how important it is to, to take care of a cavity. It's not just, you know, something little. Uh, periapical lesion, acute, Oh, this is the same thing. So this is this is just a very large area in there where you can see there's lots of bone loss, large radiolucent area, and this is um, connected to the connected to the picture from the, uh, before apparently. So here's just some more images of periapical lesions. You can just see the radiolucency. Sometimes root canals don't work very good, and they have to go in and either take out the tooth or they have to redo the root canal. Um, you know, sometimes there's accessory canals or there's just little tiny little, you know, I guess they're accessory canals that they just can't get to. They're too small, but the, there's still bacteria in there. And so it's still kind of a chronic infection. Um, here's some more uh, periapical cyst, fluid filled lesion with an epithelial lining. So star epithelial lining, um, highlight it, underline it. That's a good quiz slash exam question. Um, painless, unless infected, tooth likely non-vital if it's taking up that much of a, you know, 
real estate in the mouth there, usually bound by a thin line of sclerotic bone, usually larger than a granuloma. So a cyst is usually like big. If we're looking at a cyst, it's granuloma and periapical abscesses usually only get so big, but cysts are usually like, they can they can get pretty big. Um, originate from pre-existing periapical granuloma. So kind of the cells just sat there for a while and did one thing and then went haywire and did something else. So you have this large cyst. This is just reviewing what there is. There's the granulomas, the abscesses, and the cysts. Um, so here is, this is a horrible quality x-ray, but here's a large cyst here. And then the next picture, you can see they excised it and um, and it's just the, comes out like a big old little alien blob of tissue. But um, so that's what, um, and then they just would biopsy it to see what is inside of it. Um, so radiographic interpretation. So for when we're looking at the radiographs and, you know, you never, I've never in 20 years of practicing hygiene, I've never been asked by a dentist to identify, um, you know, condensing osteitis or, you know, a dentist has never asked me to tell them what's going on at the apathy of a tooth. But what they will like is for you to acknowledge what's abnormal. So when you can look at something and go, hey, I took the FMX for Mr. Jones today and I noticed some periapical lesion on number 12. They'll love that. You're not expected to go in there and be like, what did you do? And tell them the details of what you saw, but just notice what is abnormal. That's that's what you need to do. And you will get very good at that. Um, periapical lesion, so condensing osteitis, body's attempt to wall off the inflammation. So it's purposeful, your body's doing it for a reason. Um, radiopaque border around the root tips. And you can see all, see how dense, how much more radiopaque it is. So you'll see patient after patient after patient with normal um, bone. And then all of a sudden you'll see this sort of denser bone and you'll be like, whoa, what's that from? So it'll just, it'll just strike you. It'll just get your attention. Um, radiopaque border around the root tissue. So that periapical lesion, can, some more condensing osteitis. You see the radiolucency of the abscess or the lesion. And then you see this buildup of uh, denser bone, the body's, um, you know, trying to wall it off. The problem there is that's going to build up pressure. Like your bodies might be like, oh, I'm going to wall this off. But then you're maybe building up a lot of pressure. So the other thing your body does is like, let's get it out of here. And it drains it with a fistula. So you, the body will do different things. And that might end up resulting in someone being in more or less pain. Um, but, but you can recognize that that's what's happening there. Um, Tooth with a deep restoration, well-defined radiolucent lesion, radiopaque halo of the um, condensing osteitis around the lesion. Some more examples of that. Bone may or may not go back to normal after the extraction. So here's an example of um, the tooth. These are backwards. This one should be first. But anyway, so here's a tooth with a huge cavity. It had a radio uh, lesion there, they extracted it. And then this says eight years later, the bone still looks like that. So that's why, what, what would be important in that case? What might you want to make, what might you want to do during that, that appointment? Medical, did you say medical history? Dental, yes, exactly, notes, just write. So you wanna carry that that information forward because if eight years later the whole staff has changed, they might be like, what is happening? And the patient might have never known, I don't know what's happening, but if the notes say condensing osteitis, still there from an eight year ago extraction and you know, blah, 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 then that's what that's so important for good notes, thorough notes and carrying those notes forward for the next clinicians who will see them. Excessive um, deposition of cementum. So hypercementosis, hyper excessive, more lots. Um, cementosis um, appears as a radiopaque band along all or part of the root surface. So you can just see um, that it just looks, and I was talking uh, uh, with one of the students about cementum the other day, and usually it's very thin. Normally it doesn't affect the shape of the root. So if you have extra cementum, um, it's, this is what it would look like. And you could actually start to see like here the, the thickness of the cementum around the roots. 
Facebook. No, I haven't. I don't know that I've ever seen this in real life, but there's also something else funky happening over here, but the book didn't mention that at all. But that almost looks like a stiff. Um, periapical radiolucencies, um, this periapical cemental dysplasia. Um, so we have um, sort of a strange thing happening with the cementum and the bone. Um, slow growing connective tissue proliferation destroys the lamina dura and um, replaces trabecular bone with more fibrous. So that like they've lost some. So I'm wondering if you'd have more mobility, like you've lost the stability of the bone and it's replaced with fibrous tissue that doesn't seem very stable to me and varying amounts and it'll show up as you know this sort of radiolucent slash radiopaque look um, and the, and you can see how it can manifest different ways um, on different people this looks very super extreme and this not so much but they also have periodontal disease too um let's see um periapical radiolucency due to periodontal disease. You don't have to have this much bone loss to have a peri uh, periodontal abscess. You can have a periodontal abscess, um, you know, with not that much bone loss, but clearly someone who has that much bone loss is going to be at higher risk of having a periodontal abscess, but that can happen from um, after scaling root planing. If you didn't get the root completely decontaminated with all the irritants out and everything sort of seals up around it, you could end up um, creating an, an abscess, or if they get popcorn hole down in their sulcus, they can have an abs a pretty big abscess. So there's lots of different reasons there could be a periodontal abscess. Periapical radiolucency is related to trauma. So here we have fractured roots, um, example of the tooth with the crown fracture, example of the tooth with a root fracture. Um, I don't know where the crown fracture is. They both look like root fractures to me. Um, and then the book also showed um, bone fracture. I didn't grab one off, but if you have the textbook and you look it up, it also shows fractures in, in the actual bone as well. Um, and those would be from trauma as well, you'd assume. Just another image of a periapical abscess. Is anybody having trouble visualizing the abscesses at all? And you don't have to say it out loud if you don't want to, but if you are, um, but these, this I feel like is a little easier to identify than like incipient caries. <laughs> yes. Yes, and I don't know that I actually, I'm not so sure that I even test you on that specifically. I think it's good to know that one could be um, because like for instance, I this is a little blurry. Um, I don't know that that really looks that encapsulated to me, um, but I don't think I even test you on it. But just knowing that it's, it could be, yeah. And there may be some pictures that I can find that are, are uh, like a good example of encapsulated versus not encapsulated. This is the same picture from before with the condensing osteitis. We already had that one. Um, some more um, smaller periapical lesions. You can the, your doctor will also love you if you can pick up on this stuff when it's small. Like if you're like, I see some widening of the PDL at the apex of blah, blah, blah. Oh, they'll think you're just the best. So because that's, you know, you're touching something, you're touching something early, you know. So if you start to see widening of the PDL at the apex, there's something starting to go on. And maybe somebody else wouldn't notice it until six months later when it's like, boom, it's really big. So that's why it's so important for us to really you know, scrutinize the x-rays, looking at the bone, looking at the PDL, looking at the um, all the different areas. And they, you're not diagnosing, but you're a second set of eyes for the doctor and they do appreciate it. Some more um, radiolucency here, I guess maybe there, but I don't know for sure, but definitely there. Sometimes radiographs are just poor quality and they're hard to tell. Um, here as well. Oh yeah, root fracture for sure. Yeah, thank you. There's a root fracture and a, um, a small abscess starting there. Um, just the outline of, uh, so a recently extracted tooth. So you can see the socket outline. So the molar was taken out there. So sometimes you'll see things like that. Usually that will fill in and kind of dissipate, but you may, maybe someone would keep a little bit more of a, an outline for longer, but usually that would just fill in. And so the, so the take home message is whenever there's something odd, 
um, especially if it doesn't end up being something that's treated, it's something that's like watched, just make good notes because that helps the next person out. If there's trauma, if they fell, you know, maybe they hit their, they fell and hit their face and then you don't actually see something start to materialize for five years later. And if, if there's been turnover and, you know, it just really helps to have, and patients might remember, but they might not. So um, good notes is a key. And yay, we got through that. You guys have any questions? No, any any questions about the live patient? We have like live patient exam or um, experience. I just want to know if you can end up campaigning the medical screen to keep with the I will go ask, um, I'll ask the front office and then I'll send you guys out an announcement um, and you guys can always stop by. They don't mind you guys stopping by and asking questions. You're not bothering them as long as they're in there. They don't mind that either, but I can ask them. Um, so if you guys get your patient information in there and then I'll ask if you can print off the med history yeah, I and take it with you. And then fill it out with her. Yeah. And then um, mine's on Monday. I'm going early. And yeah. Since they're friends or family. Yeah. Yeah. I will yeah, ask them that. And then I'll send you guys a, um, a, an announcement. Yeah. Letting you know. You're welcome. Let me stop recording here.